Hi, uh, this is James Ng with Old Capital, and today's webinar for November 2023 is called The Great Reset. And so um, we're going to go through what we're seeing out there in today's market and talk about the reset that's happening right now. Um, so here we are, um, you know, November 23. This this chart just came out from CVRE and it was a survey that was done um, in Q3 of 23. And it really shows sort of where cap rates have gone. So this is, you know, prime class A multifamily assets. Um, you know, beginning of 22, it got as low as 3.37 on going in cap rates. And so I would put that at the very top. Um, so let's call it Q, Q1 of 22 as the top. And then if you go to follow the red arrow all the way down to 1.5% on the 10-year treasury, and then you know, fast forward to today, um, you know, their survey is saying about 4.92 as going in caps. And then I'm going to put us at, um, you know, right here, you know, obviously the market's come down um, quite a bit. And the question is, are we here? And we still got a little bit of ways to go. Or are we closer to this red dot where, um, you know, we, we don't have that much further to go and it's going to bottom out and pop up, pop back up. And so, you know, follow the green arrow and, you know, 10-year treasury in the time frame that since the Fed has started raising rates has basically almost hit 5% um, on the 10-year treasury and now just sits under uh, 5%. So, you know, this is where the Great Reset is occurring and, you know, 3.37 to 4.92, it doesn't, doesn't feel uh, like a crazy increase, but then, you know, when you put some numbers behind it, this is sort of the reality of what people are seeing in today's market. And so we use, you know, NOI of a million dollars and then cap rate on the left-hand side. And you just sort of start out with like a $25 million value on a on a 4% cap on a class A deal. I mean, it was lower. It was lower here, 3.37. Um, but, you know, I would say I'm just going to try to use DFW cap rates right here. Um, so 25 million uh, was sort of the peak. And then sort of where you're sitting today is probably about 5% if a deal trades. Um, so about 20% decrease, plus or minus. And then class B deals, let's say it's 425 at the peak. And those have moved probably um, to 575. So you're seeing a 25% decrease. And then class C, let's say it's four and a half. And then you're seeing it run um, almost up to seven. Uh, for deals that will trade or that do trade. And so that's a 40% decrease from the peak. Um, you know, a lot of the deals that are trading on the Class C side were not bought sort of at the peak. Those are not trading right now, but maybe deals that were bought in 17, 18, 19, um, sort of not at at the uh, four, four and a half caps. Um, so this is probably the the, the closest thing that I can show you in terms of representation of what's going on in today's market today. Um, so typical transaction, uh, what's happening today is, you know, we're seeing the NOI of the deal, we'll underwrite it, let's say it's a million dollars. So this qualifies for a $10 million loan on agency right now, so at 7%, right? So you're doing a 125 cover, um, you know, 7% is probably right in the middle, Fannie and Freddie might be a little bit under, and then Freddie SBL a little bit higher. So buyers are willing to pay um, about $14 million for a deal like this today. So let's, let's just call it 70% LTV, so 7% cap. Um, the problem is that sellers still want to sell on a six cap or lower, right? So this gap between what the buyer is willing to pay versus what the sellers are willing to sell at is creating a difference of about $2.7 million on this deal. And so that gap um, between the two is what everybody's talking about, and that is... You know, maybe this is a C deal, but then maybe on a B deal, it, it's a little bit narrower. On an A deal, it's even closer. Um, but it's hard because um, a lot of sellers who don't have to go are not going right now. And so we've seen multiple cases where, um, you know, you've done the call for offers, you've done the best and final, done all the tours, and then the seller just says, no, nope, uh, we're just going to hold on to the property. So a lot of deals that are getting listed just are not transacting right now in today's market. So what's going to have to happen um, really is rates have got to come back down. Um, so rates drop to five and a half. So we're seeing some movement today. Um, 
downward on the 10 year treasury. So if rates continue to drop, it allows the loan amount to go up. So instead of a $10 million loan, now you've got $11.7 million loan at five and a half percent interest rate. Buyers would be willing to pay 6.8, which is on top of what the seller was expecting. But of course, the seller is probably going to want a little bit more. So the seller would want to sell, let's say at 575. But that difference is only 600,000. And so when you have a strong deal, um, you know, people are going to go after it and that that gap is going to be bridged and more deals are going to happen. So this is sort of what we saw, I would say, second quarter of this year in that a lot of deals did get done when you were able to get debt in that sort of five to five and a half range. Um, a lot more deals got done uh, than, let's say, the third quarter or even the fourth quarter right now. So, you know, in terms of what's on the market right now, we're seeing a lot of loan assumptions, right? So sort of taking that debt equation off the table. Um, you know, what we're hearing is that depending on the amount of term that's left on the loan assumption, it's going to, it's sort of like uh, lighting a match. Um, eventually that's going to burn out. And so, um, you know, people, people don't want to pay. Obviously you could, you know, if it's a 4% loan assumption and you pay a four and a half, unfortunately, your basis is still messed up a little bit, right? Compared to where the market is today. And so people are still wanting to pay sort of those higher cap rates um, in terms of buyers right now. And so people are still wanting, you know, the five and a half to 6%, let's say on a B deal, and then take on a loan assumption. Um, so that's depending on whether or not the seller has to go. Um, you know, the good thing about these loan assumptions is that there's a lot of term left, there's a fixed rate, but then there's really not that much much distress on the seller, right? Whereas on the other side, on the right hand side, we see, you know, whether it's a bridge loan or it's an impending loan maturity, motivated sellers right now have those things that are on their mind, and so they're probably going to go. But the new buyer has to put on sort of more expensive debt right now, so debt in the six and a half to seven range um, on most deals. So that's what we're seeing: sort of loan assumptions and motivated sellers in today's market. You know, in terms of deals that just closed recently, so we can go through some deals in September and October that closed. I mean, you can see that when you just look across these uh, properties, most of them are A properties. Um, just that gap in cap rate has not really expanded as much. Um, and people are using agency debt, right? So Fannie and Freddie, um, you see a couple of loan assumptions down here. Um, let's go to the next page. So in terms of what else is closing, I mean, mostly... A properties. I mean, this is this is probably the first property in DFW that really has a story around. Okay, the someone bought it for um, probably close to 40, 45 million dollars. They got a loan of thirty six million in two thousand twenty one. That loan matured this year. The new buyer came in and bought it below the loan amount at thirty five million as their new purchase price and had to do a bridge. And so um, that's really the first deal that we've seen really at the loan amount or below in DFW. Um, you know, it, it doesn't really count as, you don't see it show up as a foreclosure or REO or anything like that. Those deals are getting done before um, the foreclosure happens. Um, some of these other smaller deals in sort of the Freddie Mac, uh, Fannie Mae side, but you can see that majority of the deals are really class A deals that are still selling right now. And then in October, uh, definitely more on the class A side. I would say um, this is this deal on the bottom right, Rise Heather Ridge. So this was a deal that um, similar story uh, to that Rocco deal. It was bought sort of before the maturity and um, the group that came in bought it at a discount to what the previous person had paid in 2021, but it was still above the loan amount. So there was a little bit of equity saved there, probably 10 to 15% of the equity was still recovered, um, but you know the people who who went into that deal lost eighty to ninety percent of their equity um, because of they they basically had to take a a uh, lower amount on the purchase price because um, they had an impending loan maturity and they probably had a floating rate loan. So they if you didn't have an interest rate cap, it was becoming more and more expensive uh, to keep that deal going. All right, so we've covered sort of the current market what we're seeing out there. Um, and then I want to go through some earnings calls and then also ULI. ULI just uh, came out with sort of their top 10 trends for, multi, or for all the commercial real estate. So I want to cover that as well. 
All right. So Arbor, big lender, sort of in the multifamily space. Um, they feel that they're right in the middle of this dislocation right now and that the next two or three quarters will be the most challenging part of the cycle. Um, so I think right now, as the Fed holds their rate sort of steady and these maturities come up and these interest rate caps come up, um, that's what they're thinking. This is going to be the most challenging um, before we see any movement from the Fed. And so, you know, they're thinking the next three to six months might be a time for, you know, some of those deals that, um, like, if you go back and look at, uh, let's see, the Rise Heather Ridge deal, and then also this Rocco deal, those were done on non-recourse bridges, right? Because they needed additional leverage, they needed, um, the occupancy wasn't there to get like a Fannie and Freddie loan. And so a lot of the balance sheet lenders, the bridge lenders will be coming back into the business uh, once they see better um, cost basis and acquisition basis. Um, and, you know, from their perspective, there's still um, sort of a price discovery between buyers and sellers still in the market right now. And then, you know, I mean, they did, Arbor did a, a large number of uh, bridge loans. And so, you know, their their sentiment is that, you know, these bridge deals require execution by the borrower. And, you know, whether it's bringing more capital to the table, um, you know, they're going to have to work out some of these loans, but they're, you know, they're estimating about three percentage, uh, so three points or three three percent of the loan amount to buy a rate cap, which will show, I'll show you an example of that. Of Basically, if your spread is, let's say, three and a half to four, and you want a five and a half to six percent interest rate, you have to buy a two percent strike, and that's costing about three percent of the loan amount for one year right now. And so, in terms of workouts, they they had one large seventy million dollar loan, but they gave an example on that deal of basically, you know, the asset was fine, the market was fine, everybody else was doing fine, but then the borrower was just not executing on the plan, and so they ended up, um, you know, removing that operator bringing in better management and then um, a good operator that new operator put in some money on the deal and um, they sort of recap the deal um, in order to avoid just foreclosing on foreclosing on that asset and you know a lot of people are thinking all right so all these maturities are coming up what's going to happen and so you know on this deal they said that the um not on a $70 million, a different one, but like they said that they did grant an extension, um, but they asked for a pay down of $2 million and they increased the interest rate for a little bit, three to six months. Um, but majority of the extensions that were done were sort of built in extensions as long as people qualified. And to, um, so that was Arbor. Camden is also a big operator. I think they have 50 or 60,000 units, mostly A, a units. And, you know, they're, they're, on the, I split it up in the positive and the negatives. The positive side, they're saying, look, you know, people aren't moving out of our apartments to buy houses right now just because the buy to rent premium is at 30 years high, 30 year highs. Um, but the the capital markets um definitely are impacting them, but it's also impacting development. And so they're anticipating in the next couple of years for new starts to slow down significantly, um, you know, 250,000 to 200,000. So uh, slow down and then hopefully in 26, 27, um, that's going to pick up the rent growth. But the the gap bid and ask is, um, is definitely narrowing, but they're saying that it's probably the, the sellers that are going to have to give a little bit more and come to the table a little bit more than buyers right now. And so here's a chart, Wall Street Journal, um, you know, 52% more expensive to buy a home than rent one right now, just because of where these rates have gone, right? So um, on this, they have it at $2,200, uh, new leasing or new, if you were to rent right now and 3,200 for, um, if you were to buy on a more, on a monthly, uh, mortgage. And then on the negative side for Camden, I mean, it was definitely a tougher call for them, but, um, you know, they, they said, you know, our, our new lease growth is down, occupancy is down. We have higher bad debts. And, you know, I think, couple things that stood out to me was that their their new leases uh, were down about four and a half percent but then the renewals were up about four so uh, they were pretty much flat on rent and um, you know really they talked about identity theft and fraud in some of these places and then also um, some of these markets where you just couldn't um, evict 
tenants that weren't paying. So places like Atlanta, the bad debt was close to 3%, where historically it's only been 50 basis points. Um, and then, you know, people asked about the stress and where they're seeing it. And they said they're see really seeing it really on the C, C minus transactions that were over levered with floating rate debt. So a lot of these REITs, they are, um, they focus on class A, they don't put much leverage. And then a lot of times they can just pay off their loan with like a line of credit. So they don't really use that much debt on their transactions. All right. So, um, you know, this, this report comes out once a month or sorry, once a year. And, um, I thought it was, it would be good to go through it just because, um, I think there's a lot of parallels that we're seeing across the board. And a lot of times we can focus in on multifamily, but, um, seeing sort of the broader picture, um, can be good. Um, so you, you don't, you don't get too, uh, bogged down in the multifamily land. So, um, so number one, higher and slower for longer. So higher interest rates and slower economic growth is forecasted sort of throughout across the board. Um, so that's what people are seeing. Um, number two, I would say this great reset. So this is how we started it. Um, these higher interest rates have basically reset values. And so a lot of people have been underwriting sort of aggressive exit caps. So it goes with the, with the lower, um, in place or going in caps is also lower exit caps. But now, now that we're underwriting higher caps, it's, it's hard to say that they're going to go back right back down. Um, so you have to un almost underwrite 50 to 75 basis points more on an exit cap on a five to seven year hold. Um, and that just makes, uh, you know, hitting those IRR targets that much harder, painful, but needed, um, just on the office side, it's just that, you know, we've seen it for the last three, two or three years, and they're just not seeing a full office recovery. You know, I think we're probably 50 to 60% there in terms of pre-COVID versus today, in terms of people going into the office. And then it's really all about debt. They, they compared debt to oxygen and a lot of real estate investors, um, like people need oxygen and um, it's impacting the ability to refinance and it's ability and, and it's also impacting acquisitions uh, more so in other sectors than multi and then really they talked about sort of the climate change and how it's impacting insurance and you know we're seeing insurance maybe at a thousand a door here in dfw but on the coast it might be two thousand or twenty five hundred a door which is you know double what it was just a couple of years ago all right number six um you know as um you know, I guess home ownership used to be a big goal of a lot of people, but it's becoming harder and harder. And so this housing affordability, um, at first it was rents going crazy, um, but now prices have come up on single family so much. And then now the mortgage rates have come up. And so it almost has uh, shocked and created that that gap that we talked about earlier in the, in the presentation. Um, you know, in terms of pivots, you know, this was in interesting because, you know, we don't talk with a lot of um, sort of pension funds and things like that. But a lot of these people um, who invested in downtown offices and regional malls, they, you know, that was their bread and butter for a long time. And now they're having to go into more niche investments like self-storage and student housing and single family rental. And, you know, this one, one guy was quoted, you know, these used to be super secure, like the malls and office buildings, and they were great inflation, inflation hedges. And he said, the only thing that has really stood up over time has been multifamily. So when you're looking across the board, um, I think you're going to see more and more uh, people coming into multifamily, especially in the A and B space. Um, shift to remote work has been tough um, on downtowns and people have just been going further and further out to get more affordable housing and this doom loop of you know the vacant office building uh creates retail closes closures and then you know the residents don't want to live there anymore taxes go down the cities cut services and then all of a sudden like it doesn't work there's nobody there and so um you know they're gonna have to provide some sort of tax incentives to really help sort of that office the multifamily and then the last thing in terms of top 10 trends is really the ai space and um, how that's going to impact real estate. And, you know, I think there's a lot of great plans for different things, whether it's, um, you know, replacing attorneys, replacing people to do lease audits and things like that. And, you know, property management to some extent, but it's still very new to the space and it's been limited so far, but, you know, everybody's cognizant and trying to implement it throughout their, their businesses. 
Um, you know, in terms of multifamily, they reiterated a lot of things that we said already, but, you know, the higher mortgage rates, high, higher expenses, and then the surging supply. And then this is what, um, you know, it's much less negative than other se segments of the market. And then especially around the GSEs, uh, Fannie and Freddie are providing a backbone of debt availability. So I thought sometimes when uh, you think it's it's tough for multifamily or maybe uh, you think it's tough for your part of the market, um, you have to remember, well, I'm in Texas or I'm, I'm investing in Texas and then also I'm in multifamily. And so, um, you know, those things are still positive in that direction. You know, in terms of the Fed, so they came out, they kept rates the same uh, this week. And, um, you know, a lot of people, the, the Fed keeps saying that there's potential for another hike, but the market doesn't really see it. They see them sort of uh, topping out right here over the next four or five months, and then potentially cutting sort of the back half of 24. And that's going to help um, the, the cost of these rate caps. Right now, the rate caps are about 3% uh, for one year, and then about 5% for two years or 5.5% for two years at a 2% strike. And so you're just going to have to build that in um, as a cost until um, you can refi on a lot of these deals. So 10-year treasury, I mean, I mean, every time I snapshot this, every time I update this slide, it seemed like it had moved another 5 to 10 basis points. It's just pretty volatile right now. I mean, it almost hit 5% this month. Um, it's come back down to about 4.6 um, as we record this. And so, you know, be in preparation, be, be ready to lock, um, be ready to index lock, be ready to lock your rate um, if the deal works. And then this is what everybody's talking about, right? In terms of maturities that are coming up in 2024, whether it's for interest rate caps coming due or being replenished or just loan maturities. And so I think everybody, um, you know, in 2021 was really the beginning of the bridge cycle in terms of debt lending. So um, everyone's preparing sort of for 2024. If, you know, this is just, I just ran this report for Dallas. If you want to see your uh, market, uh, definitely reach out and I can, I can send over a report for your market um, of what is maturing in 2024. Cause I think that's, what's going to spur a lot of these transactions out there. Um, so here's, here's my background, born and raised in Houston, went to school in Austin at UT been at DFW since 2006 so as a loan underwriter for, you know, sort of through the great financial crisis um, at GE doing balance sheet and CMBS. And then at Old Capital, I've originated close to $1.5 in multifamily loans and then invested in a large number of properties um, all throughout Texas. So here, here's sort of where the loan options are today, right? So you've got your bank loan, you got your agency stuff in the middle, and then non-recourse bridge obviously still seeing a lot in the agency space, uh, but more more bridge options are definitely opening up, I would say, compared to a year ago, um, where the bridge market pretty much shut down um, towards the back half of 22. It is definitely a little bit more open right now, especially with deals that have a story, deals that have a story at a reset basis. People are definitely more interested in seeing those. You know, bank loans are still getting done right now, um, you know, in that eight and a half, nine percent close to prime. And, you know, we just did a construction loan uh, with a bank. And so it's definitely not easy, but um, having a relationship, getting deposits at the bank um, and being local to that to that area help for sure. Um, on the Freddie Mac SBL side, deals are still getting done. We just closed the deal on the Freddie Mac SBL side. Um, right in this, you know, seven, seven and a half percent range on a, on a, I think that was a, a 10 year fixed with a step down. And so really just depending on the affordability, this, they're updating their rates almost constantly. Like we just got another email that, you know, rates drop 20 basis points, they drop 10 basis points or 15 basis points. And so when you sign the loan app, the nice thing about Freddie Mac SBL, you know, your rate. And so, um, they, they sort of give you a free hold there, um, on the Freddie Mac SBL side. Freddie Mac conventional deals are definitely still getting done. I would say more A and B deals on the Freddie side um, are getting done, but you know the rates are still you're probably 200 over the 10 year on most deals right now. Um, if it's a little bit uh, more affordable, they can it can be a little bit more aggressive on the spread. Maybe get it down to 175 or so. On the Fannie side, um, you know we've been doing a lot of five and seven year uh, fix with IO. And, you know, this was a deal we closed over in ULIS, um, you know, 10-year term, full-term IO on a fixed rate. 
non recourse bridge, I would say it's all about basis. So they want to see a good basis. They want to see um, that you've done this before and they're going to be pickier on sponsors for sure right now. Um, and then if you do buy this, you're going to have to go out and buy a cap of, you know, uh, probably five to 6% um, of your loan amount. So build that into your model um, when you're making those bids on deals. Um, Here's some of the deals that we closed this year. I mean, definitely a little bit lighter than last year, but we'll still probably do about 500 million uh, this year at Old Capital across uh, main, mainly Fannie Freddie, as you can see across uh, these deals, uh, but still some non-recourse bridge in there for people who are taking um, more distressed deals on. And so, you know, why Old Capital? I mean, I think a lot of people come to us to learn um, you know, whether it's a podcast, the conference that we just had, the speaker series, um, these webinars, and then really being a second set of eyes on these deals and making sure that you're sort of connected on the inspections, uh, working with the lender um, to make sure that your deals go well. And, you know, we're getting a lot of calls um, on deals that maybe have issues right now. Um, so working with the lender, not only on the front end of the transaction, but the back half, because we want to see you um, make money on these deals and figure out ways to um, kick the can down the road if we need it. Uh, some upcoming events for Old Capital, we're bringing JP Conklin, which is uh, one of my favorite presenters. Um, he's out of North Carolina. He's going to come into Dallas on Wednesday, January 17th. Um, here's a link below. Um, if you're not on our email newsletter, sign up for our email newsletter and you can get the link or send me an email. And then uh, we're gonna, we're doing what's called an old capital field trip uh, the day after. So if you're coming in from out of town, you come in January 17th that night for the speaker series. January 18th, we're going to go take a look at some properties that we financed. Um, if you're interested in that, just send me an email and I can send you details on that as well. So um, appreciate everyone. Uh, listen to the webinar if you have not subscribed to the YouTube channel so you get updated on when I uh, you know send new videos up and then um, if you're looking at a deal happy to give you a term sheet we need the t12 rent roll om and whisper price and then if you're looking at investing in a deal happy to review it and uh, if you know you're just getting started um you know to get qualified for a loan set up uh, some time to talk um, complete your personal financial statement and then we can set up time to talk and then if you're interested in joining Old Capital, send me an email with your resume. Uh, but thanks a lot for joining and um, I'll see you next month.